Joining me now with more is Sirius XM radio host and ABC News contributor Mike Muse and Washington University Assistant Professor of Psychiatry, Dr. Jesse Gold. Good morning to you both. Mike, I want to start with you. Harry and Meghan claim that there were conversations around how dark baby Archie's skin might be before he was born. But they wouldn't exactly say what was said or who said it other than to later clarify that it wasn't the queen. What did you make of that moment? Not only the fact that they brought this up, but then not to kind of specify further. I think that was the most chilling part of the interview. We all celebrated the fact that Meghan Markle was coming into the royal family to be one of the first persons of color, uh, biracial, to be part of the royal family. So many Americans, particularly black Americans, knew that race was going to be an issue. And by the way, uh, the wedding, at least, it looked like, like the family was welcoming her uh, into the family and was accepting the race. And so when the fact that they broke that bombshell of that comment about Archie's skin was chilling. Uh, it was revealing of uh, the British monarchy is a centuries old institution. Um, so it is without fault to, set, to think that racism would exist within that family. Uh, but you think that we would have evolved by now as a society uh, where that wouldn't have been an issue. Uh, but for me, what that signal was that that was one of the main or uh, many breaking points uh, for Meghan Markle. Um, yes, they didn't name the person, uh, but they kind of zeroed in on that it seems to be a senior member uh, of the royal family. So it seems I've come from the top. And, and how significant is that, especially, Mike, given how many members of the Commonwealth, when you look at the Commonwealth nations, how many of them are predominantly made up of people of color? And that's what Megan mentioned. And, and I think we have to pull some lower layers back, actually, right? And so what was how, how Megan set that moment up was she talked about how they were going to strip Archie of the title for Prince, uh, who would have been the first person of color to have that title. Uh, they were going to strip him and remove him from security uh, as a prince who would have been the first person of color within that royal family. Uh, and then to zero in on the fact of uh, the color of his skin. She talked about the representation of the Commonwealth, which is the majority, a large portions of color. And she talked about the idea of representation and representation mattering uh, and how important it would have been uh, for members of the Commonwealth to see someone in their likeliness uh, who has a similar lived experience as them uh, within the royal family. And so I think it has huge ramifications uh, to the point where the royal family, I think, will have to address this issue uh, because race was a conversation prior to the wedding. And we clearly see that race is not going away, in particular after that interview that Meghan Markle and Harry did last night. And I do want to point out that some are saying that protocol, just the, the normal royal protocol would dictate that Archie would become prince once Charles becomes king, but would not automatically become prince at this point. So that may not have been a, as big a deterrence as the interview or, or, or a, a big um, difference from protocol as the interview made it sound. I just want to uh, clarify that. Um, but Dr. Gold, the other big part of this interview was Meghan describing some serious mental health struggles that she was having, even saying that she had suicidal thoughts. What did you think when you heard her describing what she was going through at that time and then describing feeling that she was unable to get the help she thought she needed? Yeah. I mean, I think anybody watching would have felt like that was incredibly powerful, but also really sad. I mean, if and you know somebody in the royal family can feel like that and try to reach out for help and not get help, what does that mean for anybody at home, right? There's so many barriers to even being able to ask for help for mental health. There's so much stigma. There's so much shame. And she said that. She said, it's so hard to even ask for help. And then when you go ask for help, when there's somebody who says, well, I'm not going to let you get help. And the reason she can't get help is obviously not necessarily applicable to the rest of us. But there are so many other barriers to care all over this country, all over this world. But in this country, you know, cost, there's still stigma. There's family members will say you can't go. There's there's insurance. There's not enough providers. There are, you know, there's not enough beds. There's so many ways that in this country, if you ask for help, you can't get it. And it's so hard to even ask for help. So I I think hearing that and hearing that from someone like her is so hard um, and I think so real too and so important 
And I'm really glad that she said it, though. Well, and so elaborate on that a little bit, because when someone with a platform like Megan speaks out on something as serious as suicidal thoughts, what does that do for other people who are struggling? I think it makes them go, I'm not alone. You know, I think especially, I mean, we were just talking about representation for somebody who's a person of color to see that, you know, a lot of people like don't talk about that in those communities and see people that look like them saying something like that. They say, well, I'm not alone. And somebody that looks like me feels like that. I can maybe feel able to say this out loud. I can be able to tell someone in my family that that's me too. And that's really important because we need to be able to say this stuff out loud. Suicide doesn't need Need to be a dirty word. It needs to be something that we say out loud, that we talk about, that we ask for help when we need it. We have treatments. We have ways to help it. It's not something that we just like have thoughts of in behind closed doors and that's an inevitable thing. We have ways to help people when we feel like that. So I think having someone like that talk about something, you know, really could help a lot of people. I mean, Diana did that with bulimia and I think it's really powerful that Megan's doing that now. And, Mike, that brings me to my next point, which is that, you know, Harry said many times that he was worried about history repeating itself, referring to his mother and her death. But he just sat down for a tell-all interview, which is actually very similar to what Princess Diana did back in 1995. Now, that interview had a big impact on the royal family and the perception of the royal family. What do you think this one will do? I think the same. I think the stakes are even higher because, as Harry mentioned, race is part of the dynamic. Uh, Harry mentioned in an interview that that was also a huge concern of his, in particular from a security perspective, particularly what his mother went through, uh, but the fact that race is at the top of mind for them. Um, there seems to be indicators that he has proof, based upon the conversation to which he stated he had about the color of Archie's skin and the way that the British media was portraying Meghan Markle in the press were race seemed to be part of a dominant thread that was happening. Um, and so I think it was important for them to have that uncomfortable conversation. I I'm sure for Harry and Meghan, that wasn't an easy choice for them to sit down and to talk. Um, but as Harry said and Meghan said, this idea of being silent, uh, this idea of not having a voice, the idea of not being able to take the narrative into their own regard and be able to tell their side of the story. Uh, we definitely need to wait to hear from how the palace is going to respond, if they will respond to it. Uh, but it was important because he said we knew where this path would have likely ended and we've seen this before um, and so I think it took a lot for him to protect his wife um, and protect her sanity and he said that the power of the two of them being together uh, another chilling moment for me was to say he couldn't have imagined how his mother felt uh, doing it alone now the royal family usually doesn't speak about personal things so how do you see this playing out will the palace respond to this or do they keep quiet and hope it goes away what was interesting is that Harry and Meghan both talked about the symbiotic relationship uh, that the British tabloids has with the palace and uh, how the palace needs the, the press and the press needs the, the, uh, the palace as well to kind of keep the engines running on both regards. I think that this story is, is too big. Race is a dominant part of our society, both here in the United States and across the pond. Um, and so you cannot avoid uh, this elephant in the room. It is no longer an elephant. They put it on the table. Uh, about race, and they have complications within the Commonwealth uh, of, of the British government, and they represent people of color. Uh, so if a member of the royal family is talking about race, it, one would think it would be dutiful of the palace to engage in that conversation on behalf of the people of color within the Commonwealth. Well, we will wait and see if they do. Mike Muse, Dr. Jesse Gold, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.